that mutual reciprocation is so important uh, where you have that mutual sense of belonging uh, between a clinician and a patient that the patient wants you there and that you want to be there as a provider oh i gotta go hey. i've been working told them please don't hit my phone yeah. i'm in my zone bro just leave me alone hey. was on the road but i swear i'm coming home hey. now the drinks on me i think we need a toast hey. see i did it for me now my old friends calling told them nothing's for free told me time is money dog i swear i paid on my fees I was starving for this day, now my fan they can eat. Hey everyone, welcome to another Cup of Nurses episode here with your hosts, Peter and Matt. Thank you everyone for taking the time and listening. If you're new, you'll find a ton of value in this podcast and what we do. First of all, for some housekeeping, cupofnurses.com, you'll find all the show notes, any information on there. We're doing a little bit of a rebranding, so the Monday episodes, a couple of news will no longer be airing starting june 13th and we're going to have a frontline warriors podcast that's going to be airing episodes more in consciousness health wellness and everything related so go ahead and make sure you give a follow there and join us on the journey as we're doing a lot of great and exciting things and as well frontlinewarriors.com or frontlinewarriors.club you'll find everything there as far as consciousness mindfulness and we're ever expanding that so there's gonna be some exciting changes happening over summer and yeah follow along and the last thing is pronto we're creating an app that's going to innovate and revolutionize the healthcare industry it is in the works and it's going to be coming out very very soon if you're a healthcare professional you're definitely going to want to get this app as it's going to make job seeking ce's anything else a lot easier for you how you doing pete I'm doing great. Another wonderful guest today, we have Jennifer George. We dive very deeply on communication, the importance of communication, how to communicate, especially with your patients. But Jennifer George is a compassion-focused physiotherapist with a vast experience in the private and public sectors of care. She has spent the last 14 years learning and reflecting on the importance of communication in our health and education systems. She is a mentor to future and current health providers on discovering their purpose achieving fulfillment and creating empowering patient experiences. She's also the author of a book titled Communication is Care, Nine Empowering Strategies to Guide Patient Healing. Make sure you guys tune in. Really, really good episode on communication. Hi, right, Jennifer George, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you are a physiotherapist. Can you give a little bit of background about what a physiotherapist is and what you actually actually do on a daily basis? Yeah, so I'm in Ontario, Canada. So in Canada, or in Ontario, I should say, um, because every province, uh, like it would be in the States, every state um, is regulated provincially. Mm. So w we are titled as physiotherapists here in Ontario in the States. We're referred to as physical therapists. Mm. Um, and basically the gist of what we do as physiotherapists is, is we help people heal and recover uh, through movement and um, through pain management and education and you know functional retraining. Mm. And so a lot of what we do is focused on the physical side of things. Uh, but one of the things I've learned as a physio is that um, oftentimes when you're when you're truly with a patient and you're working with them and you see them and you see the big picture that it's just, you know, a small piece of, of the picture. But it's, it's a very important one. And we're often the clinicians who might have enough time to interact with the patient and, and get to know someone. Um, in a different way than maybe a physician has. And so we tend to be the eyes and ears of, of the doctors, I would say, on a hospital unit, as well as nursing too. I communicate very often and frequently with nursing staff. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I love what I do. It's very dynamic, it's very diverse, and I'm a part of, a, of an interprofessional team on an inpatient rehab unit. Mm. And how does it feel like working with different uh, patients and seeing them like progress? Uh, men are from the ICU, so progression isn't always something that we you could say fundamentally see in the ICU, but it does feel really good when somebody uh, gets like intubated in the ER and then you have that patient for a couple of days, three or four days, and then you see him get extubated and you see him like as more of like a human instead of like a breathing tube down our mouth. It feels it feels like really, it feels really good. So what kind of feelings do you get to helping people yeah. with physiotherapy and also seeing them progress and, and get better? Yeah, it's extremely rewarding. I mean, I, I've been practicing for 14 years and I started out on a, on an outpatient level. I worked in private practice. Um, I, I did a little bit of hospital at that time. I also worked in long-term care. So I've seen quite a bit of, of different um, areas as well as home care, community care. 
And um, I always had a progressive approach to patient care without realizing it at the time. And so I, I, I loved what I did then, but I, it really wasn't uh, my passion. And when I, when I came into inpatient rehab about nine years ago, I realized that this is exactly where I was meant to be because it, it's exactly what you said. We see the moment of when somebody comes in from acute care, let's say, they're quite deconditioned, they're quite weak, they can't move in bed, they could be paralyzed partially, uh, a lot of cardiopulmonary stuff. I, I see a wide range, like our, our unit's very uh, diverse um, with populations. So yeah, so seeing them from that moment to beginning to stand again, beginning to walk again, uh, do stairs again, and just you, and then seeing their personal transformation through that process of becoming more of themselves it's quite rewarding for sure and it's one of those things that keeps me at the bedside and and one of the things that's taught me a lot about you know how to connect and, and communicate with patients mm -hmm. i was just going to ask what are the major lessons that you've learned throughout your years as a physiotherapist and you just kind of hit the, uh, the nail there at the end and said communication right yeah communication is my passion um, I, I mean, I was a caregiver to my dad for many years. So at the onset of my career is when I became a caregiver. So I graduated in 2007, started working end of 2007. My dad came home from hospital after being in the hospital for about well, three different hospitals for about a year. Um, you know, so early 2008, I became a caregiver. I moved back home to help my mom care for him. And, you know, when I went through school and training, we weren't taught about communication and connection and, and the importance of you as a provider and your well-being and how that impacts patient care. Like we see nowadays, you know, burnout, things like that lead to increased safety, safety risks for patients and, and clinicians are reporting that. So, um, yeah, there was so much that I, I didn't learn from that side of things in my education, but I learned from being a caregiver, from experiencing interactions with providers mostly good some not so good and learning from both and as a clinician in my own practice um implementing that into my patient care mm. so yeah my, my caregiving yeah i'm just gonna say what are the major lessons that you learned through being a caregiver taking care of your father versus just a yeah. caregiver of just a patient mm. Right. So for me, it was it was that connection piece and recognizing that you as a provider um, actually affect and how that interaction goes affects the healing as well. So we tend to be so task focused as clinicians um, and we don't we're not as connection focused. We're not as interpersonally focused um, and recognizing the importance of encouragement and empowerment and how that can also affect uh, people's recovery and the research shows that it affects compliance it affects um, you know perception of pain mm -hmm. and injury um, and fear and, and you know and so those were things that I wasn't fully aware of back then that I just kind of experienced mm -hmm. wa watching my dad go through the system and us as caregivers so and you know when I was working with patients um, they would sometimes come in and vent and complain about a system right and and i really could connect with them in a lot of ways I, I didn't say it per se but in my head i connected with them and i could see that when they were with me that that affected the trust in the beginning as a care provider um, because they they had some negative interactions along the way and now here i am um, i'm another care provider and and you know why should they trust me right and can i really help them so providing that reassurance that um listening to patients fully validating their concerns is, is something that I, I learned more through personal rather than professional mm. experiences first. Yeah, it definitely shows you how important communication is. And it's a it's like a response communication is it's like a it's a dual approach. The listener mm -hmm. and same the speaker are both responsible for addressing any kind of issues. For example, uh, like I said, Matt and I have worked in the ICU and sometimes we see patients that are anxious and they don't tell tell us that we're anxious. So some nurses could ignore that or, you know, under a good nurse would, would ask, hey, are you feeling anxious? So someone has, someone has to facilitate this, this communication. Sometimes it isn't, isn't the patient. Sometimes it has to be the nurse because the patient isn't always going to tell you something. And it, but it, it's also like a, like a double, double edged sword kind of thing, because no matter how much you push the envelope, the patient does not want to want to talk about it. So right. they're in a very vulnerable place. And by you talking to them and trying to understand their emotions and what they're going through. They have to be vulnerable, more vulnerable than they already are. So mm -hmm. 
what is like a good approach that you've noticed to to like in and to in speaking to a patient that'll maybe have them open up more or maybe um, a right way to enter the room or and have a conversation with somebody to and to facilitate facilitate that good communication is that like a good process or like a good way to to start that off yeah i mean there's really no in my opinion mm-hmm. there's really no checkbox type list mm-hmm. i mean some people will teach that way and i've i've heard that in other podcasts and in the research when people are trying to educate on communication but what i think it really comes down to um is being present you know you come in like patients sympathize they know that we're busy especially in hospitals they know that we i hear them say that all the time they see us running around um so i think if you can give them time your time i think that means so much to them so you come into the room you knock you introduce yourself you say what you're there for um, and you're just connecting with them and you're not looking at the clock. You're not buzzing around the room and trying to communicate. You're, you're just there and present. And that only takes moments. And I think that we forget that it doesn't take that long. So it takes moments to connect, but it also takes you know moments to disconnect. So if you come in rushed or one foot out the door um, and you're trying to communicate, that, that doesn't really create a rapport. And, you know, it might take more, more effort uh, than that. Um, so I like to ask, you know, I, I introduce myself, ask for permission um, to assess, to treat. Um, and I, I simply ask how they're doing, how they're coping. Um, I ask how they're adapting. Um, I ask about their families. I ask about their home life. I, I do whatever I can to try to build a connection. And oftentimes there's something that will come up that we mutually connect on. And, you know, you start to develop a, a sense of trust at that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, as a physio on an inpatient unit, I do get more time than probably the average therapist who maybe might work in a clinic. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, if it only takes moments, it might just take more repetition, right? So you're developing rapport over time. And then if you, if you've worked with someone over time and you notice something is different there, you know, at that point you could actually say, you know, are you, are you doing okay? Something seems a little different than, than you usually are. Is there anything on your mind? Is there anything you want to talk about? Um, so it and seem, I was just going to say, it seems like communication is very experience based. It goes from feel, just like you say, not necessarily knowledge or uh, applying this to a specific process. Right. And coming from like a travel nurse yesterday, I went to a, like a travel nurse meetup and I've talked to numerous travelers and there's a very consistent message where they became travelers because they felt burnt out from their staff job and from higher management, but they're travel nursing, but they understand that the system sucks in a way. I don't know how else to explain it. Mm-hmm. So sometimes they go to work and they're already mentally checked out to begin with, which is affecting the communication with patients that we're experiencing. And a lot of times they they bring up management and they feel like they they weren't noticed during the pandemic or they just felt like they got thrown to the side and why should you do your work as hard as before when you've realized this problem and i think that's a problem in nursing right now that we're on a mission to solve for example but what other barriers have you realized in the healthcare profession as a whole that are barriers to effective communication with patients yeah, you raise a great point there for sure about um, the culture, like you were talking about earlier of healthcare right now and some of that mistrust with management and things that you're seeing. Um, but other barriers, oftentimes time is is what I commonly see um, that that people will pose as a barrier. But my, you know, my my response to that is again, it only takes moments. Add, add a personal touch in there. If somebody wants a cup of water, you know, take take a minute to get them a cup of water. Like it, it goes such a long way. Um, and again, being so task focused, and that also speaks to the system, right? Um, and systematic barriers. We do have things that we have to do in a certain period of time, and you know, we have many people to treat and see. So I get that. Um, but I do think that's also a, a big barrier is the systematic piece that which is why I, I focus more on the interpersonal piece because we're not there to appease management. We're there if we are being true to ourselves as clinicians, we are there for the patients. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, and if I can just stay present to that in the, in the chaos of the day and the hundreds of interactions we have a day, then I leave my work at the end of the day, mm-hmm. you know, at peace. Right. If, if I've acted with an integrity within myself, um, but it's it's so hard to do that when you're 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 employed and you you do have to operate in a framework that you have no control over in a lot of ways. So I, I empathize with providers for sure. 
but I also know as a caregiver being on the other side how important it was to to establish connection and um, and it does go a long way and it doesn't take as much investment as we think it does. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, yeah how, how are you how are you able to like stay in the present? How are you able to just kind of uh, shut the door to like all the other things? Let's just say things that are going on uh, outside of work, things you have with management. How are you able to kind of put that aside and just stay composed and just true to your to your patients? That's exactly one of the things I say to myself is, have I acted true um, to my patients? These are reflective things, I will say. Um, a mantra I'll say before I go into seeing a patient and I'm feeling really stressed out, maybe, or rushed, I guess you could say, is I'll, I'll say to myself, it's not about me. And I think as clinicians, we have to recognize that that's so hard. We're, we're more about ourselves when we're thinking about the systematic barriers, right? It's all, you know, it is kind of about us and not as, as much about the patient at yeah. that point. So I have to keep reminding myself of that and offering value when I can, where I can, yeah. with the time that I have. And in my mind, I try to not think about the next person, right? I try to just be, I try to remind myself that I'm here to help the person before me. And, and that's all I can do right now. Mm -hmm. I try not to be too regimented because I think that, um, so sometimes people operate and they, they have like, every patient gets the same amount of time and the same, you know, the same frequency each week. And I, I don't always operate like that. I'm pretty autonomous. And as long as my patients are okay with that and we consent on that and agree on that, um, and the quality of care is there, mm -hmm. that's what matters most is that we're focusing on and their goals. So having some autonomy in your interactions, I think is, is really helpful if, if that's possible. I think the presence, what you touched upon is very important because as nurses and that profession, we have multiple patients. So we can't spend that 30 minutes dedicated to that patient when we have two sugar checks and bed 513 needs a pain pill. And that's where yeah. our consciousness drifts away where we don't provide that presence. So I think it's very important what you just said is regardless of what's happening, just let go of that, let go of the task and just be there with them and it's crazy how your attention changes energetically and you give that to the person yeah do you I find i'm a lot more relaxed when mm -hmm. i can do yes. that sorry and and it's also wild seeing it in the ic when you have them hooked up on monitors and you know they're anxious and their heart rate goes up and after talking to them you can see their vitals change or their blood pressure and it's very profound mm -hmm. wow do yeah. you ha do you have specific questions that you love always asking your questions as like an opener to build report Oh, um, I don't have anything commonly that I ask. Um, I more or less just say welcome. Like I'm really, um, I, I express my gratitude for them to be there. Um, I ask if this is where they want to be. You'd be surprised. Sometimes people aren't sure why they're there, um, right? And so uh, w once we establish that they, that they are there for the right reasons, for the reasons that they want to be there for um, right away, you know, someone's just asking them that question. That's kind of big mm -hmm. because in the healthcare system you know even when you're doing bed moves right like patients have <laughs> they have no control over that so you're, you're suddenly moving their belongings you're letting them know they're switching rooms you're moving their belongings and you know it's it's a whirlwind right yeah so i i and i think that's the way people expect the system to just operate mm -hmm. i think that's they don't complain about it but it's just the way it is mm -hmm. and so i think if you're just noticing that and then asking people and patients if this is where they obviously nobody wants to be in the hospital but if if in that stage of their rehab or the recovery that place is where they, they need to be and they're consenting to that i think that's really important um how you know how what their concerns are is a big one what matters to them is big for me too so but that kind of comes up as we go it's not the not the opening line mm -hmm. yeah. it's more or less me greeting them yeah right yeah yeah, and I'm like thinking about what y'all were talking about. It's just like, because I'm trying to reflect back on what, what I do. Like, is there something specific that, that I do to, um, like, when I enter the room and, and things like that? But it's like, I enter a room and, like, I try to look at the patient and I try to figure them out, like, a little bit without asking any any kind of questions by, like, seeing what they're, what they're doing. Are they on their phone? Are they listening to music? Do they have pictures? Do they have cards? And you could almost kind of figure somebody out a little bit. So you, then you kind of know what kind of, question to ask first like an easy one is like if a patient has 
patient picture or not if a patient has family pictures like a good opening one would just be talk about their family like hey how's your family doing i see you have a lot of grandkids yeah. or whatever so it's kind of like interesting how we enter a room as healthcare professionals and kind of gauge on how we should approach this this patient so it's very interesting because every interaction is, is very different and mm -hmm. there's no uh, one-step approach to two things like in typical healthcare where it's like hey we're gonna this patient's gonna come in we're gonna put them on anticoagulation ppi it's, it's like a standard protocol versus when you actually yeah. interact with a patient there is no standard protocol you got to go in there with open mind and understand that everyone's mm -hmm. different not everyone abides by like the same values and, and beliefs so it's almost like a it's almost like a, like a new game you're entering in every time you enter a patient room and you just try to figure it out. And I always found that, found it very fun and very fascinating because when you do actually figure somebody out, your care is so much better and they appreciate it a lot more. Like their, their, their facial features change and it's not just like, hey, I'm coming here to do this dressing change because, you know, you have a wound on your leg because you had surgery. It's more of like, I'm coming in here, we're going to do the dressing change, but it's an experience for me as, a, as an experience for you as well. Like we're going to have a good conversation. We're going to yeah. learn something from, from each other. So I think that's one thing that yeah. every healthcare professional should, should do, just go into a room without any expectations and just try to genuinely figure out who you're working with. I love that. I love how you lead with the person. Mm -hmm. You know, you're more interested. You you lead with curiosity, and I think that's really important as clinicians. We need to lead with with curiosity to get to know someone for who they are, mm -hmm. and to connect with them on everything, maybe, but the clinical sometimes. Uh, you know, um, diagnoses sometimes we often put before patients, mm -hmm. right? And um, again, we become more task focused. Or you know, as a therapist, um, I'm thinking, you know. I could be thinking before I go see a patient, you know, how they're going to mobilize mm -hmm. when really I should be thinking about who they are and, you know, you know, what they're thinking right now and how they're feeling and, and stuff like that and what matters to them as opposed to what I need to do or what I need to assess. Um, but it all comes together. I, I think it all comes together and that mutual reciprocation is so important uh, where you have that mutual sense of belonging. Uh, between a clinician and a patient that the patient wants you there and that you want to be there as a provider i think sometimes patients can feel like they're burden they're mm -hmm. burdening staff and that's sometimes why they take risks at times like getting up when they shouldn't be things like that because they they sympathize with with the busyness of of healthcare workers so um but yeah so i think that mutual reciprocation is really important mm -hmm. and and you touched on that huge there so i, I thank you for that that's yeah, awesome if, i like that you brought up like the patient feel as like a burden because because um i know that when like when like, i was in a hospital for a couple of days i felt like a, like a burden to, to the nurses so i definitely could understand it and i definitely have seen that in my patients as well because especially because like an icu where people one day are doing everything by themselves to laying in a bed being on a fall restrictions, can't get out, out of bed, can't do anything. Like, yeah, I'm sure they feel like a burden, but it's like, it's hard to process that in your, in your mind because if you were independent three days ago and now you're like stuck mm -hmm. in this bed with all of these rules, it's hard to not think you're a burden because there's already so much restriction yeah. that, that's set up on you where it, it's just like, like, why is this set up like this? Like, what, what am I doing as, as a patient that is requiring these kind of uh, protocols that are placed on me, which is a crazy concept, yeah. but it, it's definitely, I definitely have seen, seen that a lot of patients feel like a burden. Yeah, it is like for us, what we do is common to us. It's familiar to us. We know this, how things work. We know kind of how people can recover and heal from the most tragic moments. But for for our patients and their families, it's life changing. Like mm -hmm. you said, they yeah. could be independent just a few days ago and suddenly in the ICU, like life changes so quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to keep reminding myself again that in the sense that it's not about me is that this is a life changing moment for someone. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm there for support. I'm there to guide them. I'm there to help empower them and educate them. And one of the things as a physio that, that I appreciate so much about our profession is that we help we, we help guide patients, empower them and set them up for success. You know, it's very easy for, a, for people to go through such hard times and focus on the barriers and only the barriers, right? Um, but part of what we do is also know, help them to identify where they can become more independent again where, and where that's safe to start and, and help them start to empower themselves again mm -hmm. after feeling so disempowered from what they've been through and then also from being in the healthcare system, right? It's, it's a disempowering experience at the beginning for sure. Mm -hmm. I think that's why establishing trust is very important too. And the way you communicate is going to establish that trust when great example is you have enough trust where the family member is able to leave their patient, a loved one 
at the bedside when they go home and rest because they know that you you're going to do a great and excellent job me communicate that through communication mm -hmm. so what happens when we get misunderstanding amongst patients or there's miscommunication how does that arise and how can you identify it and potentially solve it and flip it around it's a good question i was thinking about this one <laughs> um so, you know, the term, like oftentimes we hear, you know, patients falling through the cracks. Oh, so-and-so fell through the cracks. I've, I've never felt that it was the patient who fell through the cracks. I, I've always felt it was the communication that fell through the cracks. Um, I sometimes think in healthcare, um, we pass the buck a lot. Um, I think some people are, you know, just, and I get it, um, but I, I do think that's part of it. And so it takes that provider to feel empowered enough to have the buck stop there and to get things done that need to be done or to follow up on things or facilitate that for a patient, I think is really important. So I think misunderstandings come from a break in communication somewhere, whether it's interprofessionally, the messages aren't getting across fully. Um, I mean, if you think of your documentation, I don't know, I'm assuming you use EMR as well, but I mean, you document for me, I, I find verbal is the best still, <laughs> like that's the most reliable method. Um, but our, I mean, there's there's many pros to, to electronic documentation too, but we're always documenting everywhere, right? So there's, there's, there's moments where things can get missed um, almost from documenting too much in a way. So um, I think it's really important to be thorough on that and consistent on that, but also um, involving patients and caregivers and families, I think is a good is a good place as well, rather than just patients. If sometimes if patients consent to their family being there, they might want that other pair of eyes and, and ears, right? And on the conversations um, so that it, they can further help themselves and each other preparing to, to kind of leave the hospital setting in my case um, and, and stay independent and safe. But yeah, I feel like miscommunication just or misunderstandings just arise from people just not being on the same page, not listening fully, not respecting one another, um, you know, not validating what people are going through sometimes. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of room for error, unfortunately. But um, I, I think the important thing is that you're following up on, I think following up on concerns is a really big one, right? Oh, yeah. So in, instead of passing the buck, like if someone says, I haven't, ha I haven't talked to the doctor or I haven't had a, you know, I don't know what my test results show. I haven't heard from anybody. We can't just tell them to wait and assume it's all fine. We, we should, we should follow up and why not if we can. Mm -hmm. I talked to a patient that was a marriage counselor and I, I asked him like, what is the best piece of advice you could give anybody that's trying to get married? And he said, the important things for marriage is honesty and communication. So same thing mm -hmm. here where the provider has to be honest and communicate that, but also the patient has to be honest and communicate because we're mm -hmm. not telepathic. We don't understand your needs. You might really have to use the bathroom, but you're nervous about asking us or, or maybe it's about pain. You have to communicate that and be honest with us as well. And we can help communicate and facilitate to meet your needs, but you, we, we can't yeah. meet your needs if you don't let us know. Yeah. It's true. And I remember I was doing a podcast, I think, with Keith Carlson, who's also a nurse. Um, and he was saying, you know, it would be cool if patients also had communication training, mm -hmm. right, so that they could empower themselves to, to communicate and, and, like you said, express rather than withhold information. Um, and that's the other thing is sometimes um, as clinicians, we can take that personally, like when patients aren't, you know, giving us information. But oftentimes, I think, like you said, it just has something to do with what they're going through at that time. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they will share what that is at some point as they develop their trust in you mm -hmm. and with you. Is there one um, like specific <clears throat> question or era that that uh, you notice that patients really uh, need to be communicated well on like for example in ICU I feel like um, sometimes physicians don't explain everything in like the same education level as, as a patient so patients a lot of times are going to say yes okay I agree but then they're not really really sh sure 100% on what they were just were told they just were told all this stuff that's supposed to make them better and their only choice is to just, just follow this regimen without actually understanding the, the regimen so is there mm -hmm. anything specific that you've noticed with the people that you've dealt with that they um, mostly seek in conversation or, or, or to know with their care? 
Yeah, they, oftentimes they want to know kind of what happens when they leave and what to expect. And they might not even have the language for that. It's it's more that I bring that, that like that dialogue I have kind of early on with patients. Um, and it's stuff that they don't really think about. So we have time when we when we bring it up early enough, we have time to kind of touch upon in almost every session, right? And bring them back to their goal of getting back home independently and what that looks like or what it may look like. The follow-up services, navigating the system afterward, I find is, is a really big one. I find people have a hard time with system navigation. Um, so they might say, you know, you have follow-up, you know, outpatient therapy um, and the patient may say, okay, and they're agreeable to that, but they might not know what, you know, how they're going to be in contact with that clinic or, um, you know, that therapist and how they should go about doing that, whether they need a script for their insurance provider, you know, all of those little things. Um, I find that that's a big thing. So uh, that can be overwhelming for people. And it's in our case, it's a lot of different care, uh, care providers, right? Mm. That that are having these interactions. So that's why I think it's important to not just have it once and be done. I think it's important to ensure that there's understanding there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's having the conversation again. Um, maybe it's, you know, kind of having them teach back if there's certain educational things that you're going through or that they're learning about um, to maintain safety and independence that, that, they're, um, that they're sharing or that they've learned along the way. That, that's a very great perspective because we as nurses, and I'm gonna speak for the whole here, mm -hmm. we, Patients have fear, and fear is usually something ahead of time. They fear the unknown of what's going to happen in the future. But we as nurses, we're so focused and driven on a task in the present moment, like, hey, you need fluids, you need, you, we have to replace your potassium, and we're not meeting the patient's needs, which yeah. is the fear to begin with. And just like you said in the beginning, there's a lot, they have a lot better results or outcomes if you take the time to listen to them and, and meet those needs, but we're just too focused on the task again and we're not being present with them. They're not being present themselves, but if we had the time to be present, we would understand that their mind is way forward, worrying about the script, going to Juul, how are they gonna do PT, what am I gonna do now with my heart failure, how am I gonna take care of my diabetes? And right. we never have time to answer those questions because to be honest, education is the thing they could get missed the easiest because we're just task task yeah. heavy yeah and the other thing in nursing too is that you have um you have coverage right so like each shift there's another nurse who comes on so it's so whereas for us like i'm i'm the one who will oversee care um there's no other like a physio might cover but i'm the, the primary therapist right so in nursing i find that it's, it could always be a different nurse and it's almost like starting over again for some for some nurses to connect with somebody new right so um yeah and i think that's also where people can pass the buck too because they're they're kind of just covering they might not see this person after you know this shift or whatnot um you know in any of our cases so if we have the opportunity to follow up with the physician or with anybody in the care team who needs to be followed up with for this patient social work whatever it might be um yeah, I think I think that would go a long way. Um, but I also validate like the fear and the worry. Like I, 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 I sometimes will appraise patients and say, you know, I'm glad you're thinking about this. Like this is great that you're starting to think about home, that you're starting to think about your safety on, the, you know, outside of the hospital. And I just try to reassure that if that's not the right time to talk about it, like if there's too much going on, I'll just say, you know, I'll circle back with you about it for sure. We'll have this conversation again, but I want you to know that that we will help you uh, bring it all together. That you know, we will make sure that you are prepared when you leave here. Mm -hmm. So uh, just giving them that reassurance if you don't really have the if you're not having enough time for the conversation and then following up like you say you will is important. So we can't just say that <laughs> nobody follows up, right? Yeah. That, that's where integrity and stuff come in and and again um, being a caregiver that was really important to me helping my dad navigate. So yeah, something that I learned along the way. Yeah, harnessing like uh, your ability to communicate properly with patients is very very important. Have you seen like the importance of it between uh, healthcare professionals, like between your different physical therapists, like how, how important is that, like your coworker communication? Yeah, interprofessional, mm -hmm. it's, it's hugely important, you know, healthcare can be um, a toxic environment sometimes, right? And it's, it's ironic, but it, it does happen. Um, you know, one of the things I love about what I do and where I'm at is the team. Um, but I think everybody has to be on the same page, right? That's the, the struggle when you work in a team is that everyone kind 
and it has to be like-minded in a way uh, when it comes to patient care, when it comes to the goals of, of that, that team um, uh, and of the patient um, and just being centered around the patient. I'm very fortunate because I, wor I work with wonderful nurses and physicians and therapists who I'm able to communicate with any, at any point, like they're so approachable that I can go up and talk to them and, mm. and say, this is what's going on. Um, so it's really important. And again, we have to remember that it's about the patient. So, um, and, and that's the common goal. So if we can keep that front and center, um, personalities aside, mm. <laughs> um, I think that that's what we just, we just need to do. Mm. And um, yeah, it's really important to, I think also, just ha have a supportive environment know that people can rely on you that you can be relied upon um, that people can come to you um, you know I, I it's it's stressful right so we can't do it alone and and one of the things i've learned when it comes to patient care but also you know working in healthcare is the team is is the most valuable asset and i think every patient needs a team i think complexity you know especially post pandemic we're going to see a lot of that um, you know, in patient care. Um, so it's not just going to be, you know, if one physio and a patient and I'm going to be the end all be all to that patient's health, right? There's going to be a team, whether it's at an outpatient level or at an inpatient level, um, supporting them. So, yeah. So communicating Dur openly. During your journey, what inspired you out of everything? Or maybe it was one event for you to just say, you know what? Communication is this important. I want to write a book about it. Yeah, so the book came after my dad died. It was kind of, it was crazy. So my dad lived for 11 extra years longer than anybody expected. Mm -hmm. So so that's why I'm such a huge patient advocate because I've, I've heard the worst of the worst and, and we've overcome, we overcame that as a, as a family. Um, but yeah, when my dad died, it was like everything that I ever experienced as a clinician. Um, and as a caregiver kind of ran parallel and it all came to me and, and it literally was all um, linked to communication. It was like that that was that was the big gap that nobody was really talking about back then a few years ago. I mean, it's always been an issue when it comes to patient care. Like it's been in the research for a long time as being one of the top reasons for complaints and things like that. But I, I didn't find people were giving a voice to communication. Um, so it was like I got this sign, I want to say it was from my dad, <laughs> um, basically saying you need to write this book. And so that's kind of how the book came to be. I kind of recognized it along the way in my practice over the years, but I didn't realize how it all like how it all just came together and how it all just came together is when my dad died. And I literally knew what chapters um, the book was going to have in it, what the strategies were going to be, um, what I wanted to speak about. Um, so it, it came very clearly to me. It was something that I was embodying all these years and didn't really realize it at the time. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. And, and even though yeah. that experience was sad and, you know, I'm sorry to hear about that, that gave mm -hmm. you the the energy, the. How would I say it? It gave you the ability to just see it full picture, just like you said, and you're able yeah. to embody it, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, that's exactly it. Like it helped me to heal too and um, in, in grief, but it did, it, it really helped me as a clinician to maintain um, the bigger picture, just to remember and never lose sight of the bigger picture that there's always a story. Um, there's a family that this person has, like, you know, there's just so much more to, um, to just a diagnosis and, um, you know, limitations and impairments and things like that. So. Yeah. What is the name of your book? Uh, communication is care yeah so jennifer so, what's next on the mission what are you what's your next uh, obsession where do you want to take yourself or what impact do you want to make on healthcare? um so i have my podcast also called the healthcare provider happy hour so the, the podcast came after the book so it came a few months later because i felt like the book was more about interpersonal communication but i also recognized that burnout and, and things like that had an impact on patient communication and so i wanted to support providers more so that's where the, the podcast came in and it all came it, it's all geared towards coming back to empowering patient communication and, and, and experiences right mm -hmm. um, by, by providing um, support to providers yeah. uh, but the other thing I'm doing is I, I'm educating on communication and healthcare um, and I'm also bringing healthcare providers together to also reflect and share their experiences because we don't get time to do that and sometimes in our clinical practice so i think we need a an outlet to do that and i think that will also help us to show up better and be more present in patient mm -hmm. care yeah. and jennifer where can people find you at uh, so my website's jennifergeorge.co 
And so you can see what engagements are happening, what uh, events are happening, and my socials are on there as well in the podcast. I just wanted to say it's amazing that how you're creating that holistic approach because hospitals see the problem, right? They give patient surveys, they tell us what to improve on. But the thing is, is they don't give us the environment to make those changes happen. It's always a mentality. I got this from UPS because I worked there, do more with less. It's always about cutting costs, saving money, and just trying to squeeze out as much lemon juice from this lemon that they can. And that's what they're doing to us. And Mm -hmm. the surveys could only get us so far. You guys are realizing the problem, but you guys aren't taking care of the caretakers that are taking care of the patients at the end of the day. That's the that's the dilemma. I don't know why hospitals aren't investing in healthcare professionals, but maybe that's gonna be the big epiphany in the next decade. Yeah, and that's and I and you're right. I I, that's I totally align with that in the sense that um, the system wasn't divide this. um, It wasn't designed to take Mm -hmm. care of the provider, right? It was designed just to take care of the patient. But we're human too, and you know we're you know we're gonna we're gonna experience things like stress. We've been through a pandemic. We're still going through it. Like we're running a marathon here. So, Mm -hmm. um, so this is yeah. It's important for. For organizations, if they can, to invest in in provider well being mm. because it, it will impact communication ultimately. Yeah, right. It's just like like when you're running a business, if you don't uh, devote finances or time to the people that, that you employ, you're not going to be you're not going to have that good work environment. You're not going to want to have people that they're going to stay. I'm glad you brought brought that up, man. Because yeah. every time we do these like these surveys and stuff, and these results come back, what usually happens is there's something added for nurses to do like a different uh now we gotta chart this every so often because these scores were low now we have to paper chart this because we weren't hitting these metrics or numbers so it's like they're they're adding more like you said they're they're doing more with less resources so there's adding more work for nurses and they're taking away from that patient care even further which is like the exact opposite like like their solution is is worse than than what they came in in for you could say yeah and if you're this if you're this light worker you're already coming in and your your light is dying out because you're already upset with everything that's happening or this is we're already short staffed so mm-hmm. yeah the environment has to change to facilitate that yeah yeah it has to nurture that for sure mm-hmm. um and sometimes like in exactly what you're saying in the sense that oftentimes they're trying to, to correct these things with a process change right or a task change or you know and it's really a culture change that has Mm -hmm. to happen um so i think that's a whole other conversation Mm -hmm. but yeah i think sometimes we're trying to we just think it's about the tasks and about what we got to do and we're not seeing the bigger picture Mm -hmm. that we might have bodies here but people are depleted people are exhausted you know people are becoming inattentive they're becoming depersonalized they're not really you know and and when you start to feel that way you start to feel like what you're doing doesn't matter, mm-hmm. right? That you're you're st- you're starting to feel like you don't have that impact on patient care that you thought you always would in getting into this profession, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're feeling that way, I think that's a sign that you're burning out, and and I think it's important to attend to that at least for yourself, um, if if you can. But um, yeah, that's that's kind of why I've also I've been looking into communication training to impact burnout risk. Mm-hmm. Um, because like I mentioned earlier, the process and the environment, I, I don't have control over all of the systems, mm-hmm. but if I can maintain the autonomy in my patient care interactions, that's what fills my cup. And I, mm-hmm. you know, that's, I have to just stay present to that and, um, you know, and then I contribute wherever I can to, su- to support providers, because like you said, it's not a standardized thing in the system, right? In terms of organizations. So. Um, so that's why I do the podcast, and and that also helps. So. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's definitely tougher. Yeah. Like a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, maybe like it was maybe over a month, I had like a little reflection when I was at work, because especially like when we're travelers, you're the, on the bottom of the totem pole, so no one really cares about your opinions. Management for sure doesn't really care about your opinions because you're just here temporarily. Uh, even sometimes yeah. physicians and nurse practitioners don't really care about your recommendations. So it's just like sometimes you get shot down a lot. And you, you know how to fix certain things and you're not, not given the autonomy, you could say, to fix these things because no one's listening to you. So there's like there's like a lack of communication because you're not completely valid as a, as a traveler. But like the, the one thing that I told myself like a month ago or, or however long it was, was like no matter if I don't get the orders that I want or if I don't 
get whatever I need from my manager or from my scheduler. At least I'm going to uh, devote this time to like, the, to, like pr- provide like the best patient care for my my patient. You know, yeah. so it's like at least I could do this one thing and and like not have a regret that I missed something or or I could have done done this and I could have done that because sometimes there were times where I left work and I, and I was like, man, I should have you know set up the ng tube and before i left or whatever so i tried to be a little bit more meticulous on not not leaving something undone even though yes yeah, sometimes mm-hmm. uh time is a, is a factor and i have to leave things undone i try to at least have that taken care of because all the other things with management my coworkers, that's kind of out of my control at least in yeah. the icu i have full control over my patient's care so i try to at least do the best i can can with that because you know because yeah. then otherwise i feel like i get burnt out more if i get caught up into like this managerial and the communication with the coworkers kind of kind of thing. So at least I yeah. told myself mm-hmm. I'll at least provide uh, like really really good patient care for like these contracts. It's like leaving your right. shift with great integrity versus mm-hmm. guilt and shame. Right, exactly. 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 It's leading with that rather than focusing on, mm-hmm. you know, what's not going right. Because yeah. there is a lot. And because my fear there is that clinicians will give up. Like they're going to think that they're not having the impact on patient care, but I'm trying to tell people who are still in the profession, right? Because we know a lot of people have been resigning that that the, that it still matters, that, that their care, that the, they're providing one-on-one to patients, like it is having an impact and we need you there. Um, so um, even if, you know, the system's telling you otherwise or they're not recognizing, um, you know, I just hope that you know that mm. that you you are having the positive impact that you intended on, and that's what matters most. Yeah. Um, and this is where the team communication is so important that you can talk to colleagues, that you can you know communicate and um, just vent in a way, but also then get back into supporting one another because um, you need those moments. You know, you kind of need to the, to release the, the energy that we build up and the emotions that we ride throughout one single day. Uh, I know for me and nursing staff, like I try to help nurses where I can on the floor, like with, you know, toileting needs, things like that. Like I just try to do what I can to fill in those gaps where nursing, you know, you could just see them running around like crazy. Um, so I just think supporting your team is is super helpful uh, yeah. where you can and where it's safe for you to do so. Yeah, hundred percent. Like circling back into like management and their and their surveys. Like I, I was thinking while we're talking about it, like if if you have a management system that looks at their surveys and their solution to fixing these problems is, is adding more work to like the physiotherapist, to the physician, to, to the nurses. Well, I think that's going to cause it's it's going to cause like a toxic work environment where healthy professionals are going to ignore the problems that, that they see because they mm-hmm. realize that, hey, if they point out this problem and, and they ask for a solution, then that solution is going to be more work added to them. So it's going to lead to this, like, uh, you could say, passive blindness, you could say, where things aren't, aren't going to be, be changing because no one's reporting the need for these changes because these changes always always equate to more work being put on healthcare professionals. And, that, and that, that's mm-hmm. very bad for a facility. I think that's a very bad management structure if you if you implement every correction with more work, because then no one's gonna to wanna to tell you what, what you're doing wrong. Because every time you say something, op- open your mouth or communicate it, it's just going to be adding work for uh, for, for somebody else. And I think right. that's a better way of, of solving things. That's never, nothing's ever going to get solved because just keep on putting band-aids and band-aids, no one's addressing the, the actual problem. Yeah, I can hear what you're mm-hmm. saying there. And I think it, it does need to be a collaborative approach. Yeah. I think who better than your frontline staff to know, you know, what you need, what needs to be um, changed or what can be better implemented to preserve ourselves mm-hmm. and, and help us, but also mainly to support patient safety. Like, right. you know, the more that gets added on, we have to think about patient safety, mm-hmm. right? So I think if you're bringing that to the forefront, um, that's the conversation that needs to be had as well. And that might be another way of, of talking about that um, because that's the, the main focus, and that's right? Like, and it, you have and less resources. Excuse me. And that's a great way to, you brought up a problem and the solution is always having patient safety in mind. If you mm-hmm. always have that as the pillar, mm-hmm. then you're always going to be working with integrity. And no matter yeah. what problems are going to rise, that integrity is going to just outpower the the negative emotion of just kind of sweeping underneath the rug mm-hmm. where hopefully we always could maintain patient safety. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, total, you totally connect with that, Matt. That's awesome. Yes, yes. I, 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 I love, love it. You, I, I love, love that your you message. See that. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Um, that, that happened recently, actually, where we were chronically short staffed on the rehab unit, just staff getting sick. You know, it's a pandemic, people getting infected or loved ones, and they have to isolate and be at home. 
And I remember saying to my colleague, I said, my focus right now, it's not so much achieving the, the maximal goal for a patient right now, it's keeping them safe, <laughs> right? When we're short, my goal is patient safety, um, first and foremost, because that, that's always the goal. But I think sometimes, you know, when you are fully staffed, and you, you, know, you can build on that, obviously, you're going to do that. But, you know, at the core of it all, patient safety is everything, right? Yeah. So I think it always comes back down to that. And like you said, to our integrity as a provider and upholding that, at, at least at a patient provider level. If only management can, can look at us as like the patients. Like, you know how we have our patients as we got professionals? If only management could look at us like the patients. Like, instead of, hey, instead of, hey, let's try to achieve magnet status, let's maybe first achieve a, a happy core staff. You know, something so yeah. simple like that. Because not every hospital is magnet status, and it takes a lot to achieve magnet status. But is that magnet status going to be worth it on paper if, if, you, if you have a high turnover rate with nurses, if you can't keep a core staff? Because... Getting magnet status and then losing it, it looks like shit. It's 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 mm. it's better to not get it at all than to have it and then lose it because you got it and then you somehow you messed up something, right? So that's just showing you you messed something up. So okay. instead of like trying to achieve these giant goals of getting maybe getting more funding or uh, getting these awards, maybe it would be a good idea to first think of like the fundamentals of the hospital. Is mm -hmm. is every unit functional? Is are, is every nurse maybe not every nurse, but are mo most nurses satisfied? Are most physiotherapists satisfied? Are CNAs satisfied? Are the physicians having enough hours off, or are they being overworked? Like, is there enough enough in the core to then we could stem out from the core and actually build something? Because you can't build something without with a poor poor foundation. Sometimes I feel like in healthcare, yeah. they're just adding more cement to it to keep it standing. You're just adding walls, you're adding two by fours, not necessarily fixing the foundation that's broken. You're just adding layers to keep it keep it up and standing, which is which mm -hmm. is a flaw and it's not a very healthy way to to run something. But it's healthcare. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's kind of in like the shadowy place because you're dealing with health. So it's not always on a public forefront unless something crazy happens like a pandemic or like some kind of a crazy, you know, illness is going around. You don't really yeah. see it. It's not like a, a financial thing where you're required to report your finances every month. You got to hit these mm -hmm. metrics, why is the metrics being hit versus healthcare where it's very, very shadow and very private because no one likes the healthcare out there, which I understand, but it's like, we got to fix it somehow. And the way we've yeah. been, we've been just adding these two by fours and these layers aren't really fixing the, the fundamental uh, okay. problems with this. <laughs> It's a pretty reactive approach, mm -hmm. right? It's it's always even at that level, um, not even just you know care wise that sometimes people will say right about the Western yeah. healthcare system being very reactive yes. and stuff. Um, but even at that level, it, it's reactive too. Like especially when the pandemic hit, like burnout and things like that. That's why I started the podcast because I knew it was rising, and that was pre-pandemic. And then the pandemic hit, and it's like doubled now, right? And now we're seeing people leave the profession. Um, and then this is another thing maybe Matt you'll connect with here too is like you know just the other day I was focusing and I was thinking why am I focusing on the people leaving the profession I need to be focusing on the people who are in the profession mm, still yeah. who are still here and that's kind of that shift for me mentally like just doing all that I do right now um, really just helped me to to bounce back in that moment and and I got it again it's coming back to what I can control what I can contribute um, you know, where, where can I add value in my patient care? And if we all could just maybe add value where we're at, rather than thinking we have to have all the answers to a very elusive issue that's out there right now. Um, it's, you know, I think we would be a little more compassionate with ourselves and realize that we're doing a way better job than we give ourselves credit for. <laughs> 100%. And I like that you brought up that the healthcare is reactive because Matt and I, we literally had, we were nurses for a couple of years and we realized that, hey, we've literally said the same thing to ourselves is, is medicine is, is reactive. For example, you go to your doctor, you have hypertension, throw you on a pill. Uh, yeah. you, you're, you have symptoms of depression, throw you on an antidepressant. And what they're lacking is that communication, communication aspect where it's just like, why are you hypertensive? Why are you having these feelings of, of depression? There's something that yeah. there's something that we could solve without this pill. So we're, so we're not so reactive because you come in with me with a symptom, I throw at you something else. That's not how it should be. It should, you should treat like the underlying cause. In nursing school, we're always taught treat the underlying cause. And, and we come into healthcare as nurses, we're not really treating the underlying cause. We're just treating the symptoms that is an underlying cause causes. And you're never mm -hmm. really figuring out the actual problem in, in, in the person. I understand that we work in the ICU, so it's more acute. So we don't always have time to think about that because it's more of like, hey, we got to fix this now or the patient's going to die. But I feel like in general, healthcare and physicians and nurses and, and everybody else in healthcare is just more reactive than, than anything else.
Mm-hmm. And I feel like okay. communication is is a key to take it from being from taking it from being reactive to like the next level. Yeah, and I mean, it doesn't all have to be on the physician mm-hmm. if they if they're if their patient trusts them enough to have that conversation with them like you said like talk about maybe why they could be hypertensive um or why they could be diabetic or you know and and kind of referring them then to other providers who can also help them more holistically and more as a whole person and being rather than just you know focusing on one impairment and treating the symptom of that um i I think is is really important i think communication is, is a big way to help patients break down those walls too Mm -hmm. to get the care that they they actually need and maybe don't have a voice for yet to say that they need or don't even know right until Mm -hmm. they actually have the conversation so again like for me um sometimes like i'm the first one who has that conversation not the physician maybe with the patient and then i'll go back to the physician or or to let's say psychology or something and just you know facilitate those referrals uh for patients Um, sometimes it's you know nursing obviously like they're very much involved and they're you know they're having those conversations and they identify those gaps in patient health um, that could be filled in with just a a simple referral right it doesn't all have to be on one provider but you know but you know in the confines of the four walls we all need to work together but globally as a system we need to too right and recognize that we all have value here and you know there's so many nurses there's so many therapists and we all have a role to play a value mm-hmm. and that, that's us. an important paradigm shift that you're doing with your work is you're yeah. not focused on the lack which is the people that are leaving you're focused on what's already there and how you can nourish mm-hmm. that cup and cultivate that better environment and then through that example the people that are already that left because of like the lack of hope of the change they'll come back potentially so yeah it's very important I, what I, we're doing I hope so i yeah. mean all you have to do is go onto twitter and you know you'll see a lot of people like literally like you can feel them screaming about all of the stuff that's going so wrong right now and and sometimes i feel like to focus on that it just breeds more of it um and it, it creates more barriers and more where i i'm focused more on um, voicing the solutions um, yes. and hopefully attracting more solutions yeah. <laughs> and more hope and and yeah. that's like the thing in life is everyone has problems you have problems I have problems right. you're not any more special but the whole point of us being in in life here being in this moment is to solve them mm-hmm. we're meant to be yeah. solvers of them not channel and echo out the problems that are already there and victimize ourselves right yeah. and yeah, when you think of patient care, that's what we're doing, right? We're coming together and we're helping our patients heal. And, you know, we're helping them to grow into who they can become, you know, after what they've been through and this new version of them and creating the most, you know, independence that they possibly can and empowering them again. And I think we need to do that with providers as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, Gen- Jennifer, yeah. thank you for getting on today with us and having this profound mission and talking about communication i feel like a lot of nurses and everybody listening can relate and hopefully these little nuggets of knowledge can make an impact in somebody's patient care and be more present and communicate openly with their patients and jennifer so much for having me yep and jennifer a name of your book one more time where people can find you yeah it's called communication is care nine empowering strategies to guide patient healing and you can check out jenniferGeorge.co, and that has basically everything there my website Awesome. Thanks so much for your time, Jennifer. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks for all the work you're doing.